So if you've never read Great Expectations, probably encountered it in some form or another because Dickens is everywhere. And you know, there's been tons of movie adaptations. There's been you know, ones with Alec Guinness in them, one with Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe got his acting start. That's the guy who plays Harry Potter. He got his acting start playing Pip in Great Expectations um, in a movie adaptation. So, you know, but you can learn everything you need to know about it in less time than it will take you to watch any of those movies. And I am certainly just as entertaining as Gwyneth and young Daniel Radcliffe. So here we go. <laughs> the novel was published serially 1860 to 1861. This just means that, like, chapters you know, usually end without resolution because he was trying to make it a cliffhanger so you'd buy the next issue of the magazine. You know, it's kind of like Lost, right, where they, they force you to watch the next episode because they, like, end with dramatic music and you don't know who's in the hatch and all of that. Uh, luckily, Grey Expectations doesn't disappoint you and make you cry like the end of Lost does because it so doesn't wrap everything up in a neat bow like you, like they promised you. Anyway, um, Major characters in Great Expectations are the first, ob obviously, Pip, who I mentioned before. That is the young Daniel Radcliffe character. Um, since the novel is a Bildungsroman, which is just following along a character's development as he gets older, um, it, Pip is the guy that the Bildungsroman is about, and so he's kind of the main character. Uh, we learn early on that he's, you know, he's passionate and idealistic, and he's really, really moral. And you know he's always he's always looking to improve himself in in a social kind of way and also in a moral way. Uh, next we've got the convict who is also <laughs> known as Magwitch, which is another one of those awesome Dickensian names, and he's kind of an interesting figure. Um, you know he's he's a convict as <laughs> you might have guessed from his title. He's on the run from the law, um, but he also does some really good things that we're going to talk about later. So he's kind of uh, maybe a morally ambiguous kind of character. And there's Miss Havisham, who is kind of seems like a crazy person when you meet her. She hangs out in her old wedding dress um, because she got like abandoned at the altar. Her, her wedding didn't happen, and so she basically hangs around in her old dress, which is kind of like an episode of 30 Rock. Well, I guess that's when she buys her dress without... <laughs> <laughs> without having a wedding in mind, but same kind of idea. Um, you know, there's like rotting food and memories, and she's she's just a weird character. Um, and she <laughs> she hangs out in a room where all the clocks are stopped at 20 to 9, which was the moment she found out that her fiance left her. You know, she only wears one shoe because she was only wearing one shoe at the time. It's like she's she's kind of a crazy person. But she's the guardian of Estella, who is someone with whom Pip is infatuated. He loves Estella. And she lives this kind of upper class life. She's beautiful. She's kind of cold and manipulative, kind of like Gwyneth Paltrow, if, <laughs> if you want to typecast things. Um, and there's other characters that I'm going to talk about as we go along, but these are kind of the most, the most important ones, the ones that are going to you know, crop up again and again. I don't want to have to keep reintroducing them. So major, we're gonna before we get to the plot, I'm keeping you kind of on the edge of your seat. We're gonna talk about one more thing, which is major themes, because this is something that we can we're gonna introduce them, and then you can kind of see how they unfold as the novel goes forward. I mentioned before it's Bildungsroman, you know, and th and that's important because, you know, Pip, who's again the main character, is really he's full of ambition, right, and that really propels him through his life. He has, wait for it, great expectations. Uh, for himself and for like what his life is going to be, and and, and, and so his his moral development is really central to the book. Um, like any good buildings Ramon, right? He has to develop. He has to change as it goes along. Um, he has a really strong conscience, and he's always, always, always worrying about acting immorally, because he recognizes that immoral behavior is not good, leads to punishment, could prevent him from reaching his goals, all all bad things. Um, and so that's, so that's one sort of key thing that we're going to look at. The other is a huge deal in this book is social class. Dickens portrays people from every, you know, every strata of Victorian England's class system. And Pip always wants to really ascend the social ladder. That's, that's his, one of his goals. And, you know, it's important to think about this issue of class in the context of, you know, of when the book was written. Because, like, prior to the Industrial Revolution, class was who you were born, and that was basically it, right? You're either born into the aristocracy 
or you weren't. And that was kind of how it broke down, right? There's like aristocracy and there's like everybody else. And But by the time Dickens was writing, by the time he wrote Great Expectations, the world was actually changing quite a bit. And by this point, you could achieve wealth and status through your work, which is more similar to the world that we know today. You know, because now we basically take for granted that if you work hard and you go to school and do all the right things, you can climb the social ladder even if you're, you know, born into poverty, which is kind of... Kind of, you know, kind of one of the tenets of America in a way, right? That's the American dream is that you can, you know, achieve what you want through hard work, and it doesn't matter what class you're born into. Um, you know, and we, but even you know, in the early days of America, right? All the presidents were rich guys. Um, you know, now we get someone like Obama who had you know difficulties and hardships growing up, and now he's president. And and that's so the world that Dickens is telling us about is one that's kind of in transition from you know, prior system where it was pretty much who you were born to current system where you can, you, know, you can fight your way up, but it's kind of people are figuring out how to do that, what the best way is, and what sort of new challenges are associated with that kind of world. So finally, <laughs> we're going to get to the story. I know you've been waiting patiently. Um, the novel opens fairly ominously. Pip is hanging out in a cemetery, and He's, he's a young orphan, which is sad, and he's looking at his parents' tombstones, which is extra sad. And as he's doing this, as he's kind of <laughs> wallowing in his sadness, um, an escaped convict appears and orders him to find him food, orders Pip to find him some food, and also a file so he can, like, file the shackles off. And uh, at this time, Pip, he's, he's living with his sister, who is not so nice, kind of abusive, and her husband, whose name is Joe. And so he, he runs, you know, when the convict tells him to go get food, he runs and he gets, gets some food. He gets the file, he brings it to the convict. He briefly runs into a second convict, which I only mention because it will be important later. For now, just know he runs into another guy who's also escaped from jail. Um, and here's, you know, here's our really first example of Pip's, you know, sterling character. Right, he's terrified of the convict. He is, you know, as, as I think as you would be if you were hanging out in a graveyard and some man in shackles jumped out at you and <laughs> demanded food. Um, but, he, you know, he honors his promise to help him. That's, you know, important to him. But, you know, helping out the convict kind of leads to a guilty conscience because he expects he'll be arrested for doing that, especially after he learns that the convict was found by the police shortly after Pip helped him. So he gets a little worried that maybe he's going to get sort of taken down by this guy. So a while later, Pip's uncle takes him to Saddest House, which is where Miss Havisham lives. Remember, like, crazy lady in a wedding dress, all the clocks set to the same time? Um, and, and Pip's uncle and his sister think that Miss Havisham, who is quite wealthy, will make Pip rich as well, and by extension them, so that's their genius plan, and so they send him there. Uh, Miss Havisham just wants someone to play with Estella, so that's where Pip falls into all of this. Uh, of course he falls in love with her, because... That's just you know what little kids do, I guess. Um, but she's kind of not that happy about having to play with a boy who's, you know, not of high social status. <laughs> um, you know, again, kind of imagine Gwyneth Paltrow having to go to Walmart, where I don't think they sell, you know, brick pizza ovens or whatever this stuff is she <laughs> advertises on her blog. Um, but you know, regular playdates at Sadis House don't, unfortunately, do not lead to fortune for Pip. Um, instead, Miss Havisham just ends up helping him become an apprentice with Joe. There's this kind of sweet country girl named Biddy, which is kind of a horrible name, um, <laughs> who kind of might be into Pip, but he still has got his sights set on the high class Estella. And things aren't going all that well for Pip at this point. Um, but then things take an unexpected turn for the for the better um, when a lawyer turns up and tells Pip that a mysterious benefactor has you know given him a ton of money and you know he has to go to London and become a gentleman that is what he's supposed to do with the money uh, Pip thinks the benefactor is probably Miss Havisham which like makes sense because he's the only person that you know she, she's the only person that he knows who seems to have any money uh, but so he goes to London and this process of becoming a gentleman really ends up a process of becoming kind of a jerk. Um, you know, it's a, the age-old saying, "Mo money, mo problems." Uh, you know, he's he's kind of rude to Joe, who's really been nothing but nice to him, and he starts running up some debts, which again, this seems to be what happens once you have a little taste of what money is. Uh, but one night, the convict, remember the guy from the graveyard, the convict that Pip that Pip helps, turns up. 
and he reveals that actually he is the benefactor. And now we learn that his name is Magwitch, again, one of those awesome Dickensian names. Uh, he, he probably didn't, you know, like being just referred to the convict all this time. Uh, and you might be wondering, right, he's an escaped convict who got rearrested. like how did he get so much money? Turns out that he was so affected by being helped by Pip, like he was so moved by that, that he then spent his life making a fortune so he could help Pip become a gentleman, which kind of, you know, I <laughs> don't we all wish that the world revolved around us in that way? I guess you just need to transport yourself to a Dickens novel and make yourself the main character, and everyone will just want to help you with stuff. Um, but so Pip feels kind of bad about this, he feels a little guilty. Uh, but Magwitch is still a convict, and Pip decides to help him again, because he couldn't really say no, because of the whole, you know, giving him money and a new life thing. But this is where, remember when I said about the second convict, right, you should remember who he is. So th this is where he comes in. That guy was actually named Compison, which is <laughs> a silly name. Um, and it turns out that he is the guy who abandoned Miss Havisham. Again, it's a very small world in Dickensian London. Um, you know, it, all along, Compison was just conning Miss Havisham out of her money, which is sad, because she's obviously so torn up about it. Magwitch was just like a criminal who worked for him, and so they were arrested together during this, you know, during all of this. And, you know, like any good con man, Compison adapts to the situation, and so now he's helping the police find Magwitch, so he's kind of, you know, traitorous. So now he's really turned into a real villain, right? He, he messed up Miss Havisham, he, now he's after Magwitch, who's Pip's benefactor. Um, and then we get another really big reveal that just is, you know, how small is this world? It turns out Magwitch is actually Estella's father. What? So she wasn't born rich, and Miss Havisham just raised her to break men's hearts as her revenge for being, you know, dumped at the altar. Um, and ultimately, <laughs> it turns out that Pip was brought in for Estella to practice on, which is kind of sick and seems awful of both Miss Havisham and Estella. Anyway, Miss Havisham repents and kind of apologizes to Pip and says, oh, I'm sorry I did this. Um, after Estella marries someone else, she marries Bentley Drummle, who's kind of a rich jerk with an, uh, he has an awesome British name, Bentley. Um, and <laughs> okay, so that, that was kind of nuts, right? All of those people that turned out to be related to each other. <sighs> Crazy. Um, next, we're going to get some action, which, you know, finally, right? Pip's trying to help Magwitch escape from London, because Magwitch is still a convict. Uh, there's, like, fight scenes with characters that are way too minor for me to mention. Pip almost gets killed, then he doesn't, then Compuson turns up, and Magwitch actually kills him, which, again, he totally deserves for, like, being really nasty to Miss Havisham and to Magwitch. Magwitch is eventually arrested and given the death penalty, which is sad, because he didn't seem like that bad of a guy. Pip gets sick, which keeps him from prison. Joe, remember nice Joe, who Pip was an apprentice to? Joe, you know, his wife died, so he turns up, it's, you know, briefly. And he's really kind-hearted, and he cares for Pip, and that's, uh, that's nice. Um, and now we start realizing that maybe the best people aren't upper class after all, because Joe is awfully nice. Pip's beginning to see that. He decides he's going to rush home and marry Biddy, uh, who I guess he figures has been waiting for him all this long. Remember Biddy, she was just around, and Pip assumes that she'll marry him. But then Joe marries her first. <laughs> so I don't know who saw that coming. I sure didn't. Uh, and seeing no other options, Pip decides to take a job outside of England and just goes off and leaves for 11 years. Um, at this point, so the, the novel actually has two separate endings. There's the original ending, and there's the revised ending. The revised ending is the one that you would read today if you like picked up a book and you wanted to read Great Expectations, which I recommend. Uh, so we're going to start with that, right? Revised ending, Pip returns to England. He heads back to Sadis House. All that's left is this kind of ruined garden. It's you know gone into disrepair, and Pip finds Estella wandering around, and it turns out her husband has died. And then Pip and Estella kind of reconcile, and they leave the garden hand in hand, maybe never to be apart again. That's kind of the implication, uh, which sounds awesome, right? That sounds like a nice, lovely, happy ending. Well, Dickens' original ending was not that. <laughs> Dickens originally had Pip encountering Estella in London, and he comes back, uh, and she'd actually remarried after her husband's death, and they talk briefly, and then they just go their separate ways. 
Uh, and you know, critics argue that the original ending, right, so the one I just described, where he doesn't end up with Estella, actually probably fits the book a little better because, you know, to complete Pip's development, he really can't be still pining for Estella because she still represents this kind of upper class ideal that has been thoroughly debunked by this point. Uh, you know, but it's kind of like, but, you know, people wanted a happy, sappy ending. So he had Dickens just, you know, he, he was a man of the people, or he wanted to give them what they wanted, so he just changed it for them and made it happy in the end. It's kind of like how they changed the ending of, you know, I Am Legend, right, that Will Smith movie. Instead, he blow, you know, instead of helping them, he blows them up. That wasn't how it was originally was. Um, or like the, you know, remember, remember the Genes Jennifer Aniston movie, The Breakup, where originally they were actually like going to break up and that was it, but then they changed the ending so that they might get back together because the original was just too depressing. That's what happened to Charles Dickens and Great Expectations. So uh, that's, that's the end of the book, or the two endings of the book. Um, sum it up, Great Expectations is a bildungsroman about Pip, who is an orphan who kind of strives for a higher social class and also to become just a better person. Uh, he kind of learns along the way that his pursuit of social success might come at the expense of his moral growth. I think that's a message we might all be familiar with. Um, ultimately, he ends up kind of humbled and with his lifelong love, Estella, or not, depending on <laughs> which ending of the book you read. So uh, yeah, that's great expectations.